In September, I read 15 books. In August, I read 16 books. Now, that is a lot higher than usual for me, so I don't think that I'm gonna be reading quite as many this month in October because I am planning a wedding reception, which turns out to be like the bane of my existence because I love to attend weddings, but I absolutely just hate the process of planning them. And it's not even that it's hard, it's just boring. And I am also going to be going to Japan next weekend. So the second week of October. I am super excited about that. I will be filming one of my Reading Around the World vlogs, but I'm getting ahead of myself here because as far as this video is concerned, we are still in September. I'm gonna be telling you about the 15 books that I've read. So I started the month off by reading The Bitter Twin and Poison Song. This is the second and third book to the Winnowing Flame trilogy. I read the first book at the very end of August and I absolutely loved it. I loved it so much and the second and third book really didn't disappoint. It actually <laughs> broke my heart a little bit. So this series follows three-ish main characters. One is named Felnoon. She is a witch who has escaped from the winery. She has kind of like a fire magic and it really develops a lot through the series, but this sort of winery place keeps all of the witches and all the women with magic. Uh, hidden and sort of isolated from the world. So she escapes and she ends up meeting with Horval, who is a, a Borean, and he is sort of a another race. But basically the Aborians are kind of linked to their god. They are this other race that is humanoid, but like long and big and you know, they might drink blood. And they're connected to this tree god who is currently either dead or in retirement. And so is his race. So he has kind of abandoned his country and he's known as Horval the Oathless. He currently travels with Vintage, who is a woman in like her 50s-ish that is just fascinated by this force that had formerly invaded their world. Each invasion of this Horse is kind of called a rain and so the first book begins while they're kind of anticipating the ninth rain coming. The three of them meet up and then things begin to happen. <laughs> the plot gets rolling. It, it's a very difficult book to describe but I really liked the series because it is very different. It is kind of a interesting blend of fantasy, like you have dragons and other winged creatures, and you have a lot of kind of unusual sci-fi elements in there as well, um, as well as a very sweet, very slow burn sort of romance. When I finished this book, I was then immediately going to make dinner, and my husband walked into the kitchen and I was like cutting, not onions, and I was like sort of like, <laughs> my husband's like, what's going on? Are you okay? I'm like, yeah, the book just ended. So this is like, one of the first books in a really long time that has made me kind of tear up at the end. I am not a crier at all, but I really loved all of the characters. I was just so invested in all of their stories and it was such a fun ride. I was so sad when it was over. So that is The Winnowing Flame and this month I read The Bitter Twins and The Poison Song. After that, I read Thorn Hedge. This is by T.K. Kingfisher, and so it is sort of a dark fairy tale. It's not a retelling, it's inspired, I think, by Sleeping Beauty and Rapunzel from the perspective of Toadling, who is a fae type creature with a bit of a complicated history. We get to see as there is a back and forward uh, flashbacks of how she became the guardian of this tower where there is a figure inside sleeping and the story kicks off when she encounters a knight and it flips back and forth to the present when she's getting to know this knight and he's interested in getting in the tower and we find out who she is who is in the tower and why i really love this book so much the style reminded me a lot of holly black like it felt like the kind of interpretation and the way that she did the fae in this really reminded me of that traditional dark twisted fairy that Holly Black typically writes. Toad Lang is, I believe it says on the back cover, she is toad shaped. So she can like drop into the form of a toad, which is hilarious and weird, but I love how TK Kingfisher really takes an element or an aspect of a character and builds on it and builds it out 
so that you have a really fleshed out, really interesting character where the traits that they're given don't affect them in isolation. Like the way she thinks and the way she moves, a lot of it is partly informed by her toad shape. It's it just it's a kind of a delightful read. I think it's dark, but it isn't really like dark. It doesn't make you feel heavy or gross or bad by the end. It's also a really short little book. It's more of a novella, like a hundred pages or so, and I just love this so much. After that I read Night Bitch. This book is super bizarre. I, okay, it's kind of challenging to describe, but I also really loved this one. So this is about an artist who became a mother and is kind of struggling with the experience of motherhood. She is, you know, stuck at home taking care of her child, who she loves, but it's just making her feel a little feral. At the very beginning of the book, she begins discovering that her canines are changing shape and she's growing like strange patches of hair and becomes convinced that she is turning into a dog. I felt like this explored some of the complex feelings that come up around motherhood in a really great way. To be honest, it is really fun if you like sort of a lighter horror or magical realism type of book because there are parts that are sort of a mindfuck. Uh, just be aware there is some like animal cruelty in this, I guess. The, you know, she turns into a dog. Some animals get eaten or killed. But I read this on the way to work and I seriously considered just hiding in the toilet cubicle so I could finish it. Um, I did not do that, but the temptation was definitely. After that, I read Astrophysics for People in a Hurry. Now, I first started reading this because it was my husband's book and I had hoped that People in a Hurry translated to astrophysics for dummies, which it does not. I guess there's kind of a limit to how much you can dumb down astrophysics, because <laughs> this is definitely a very small book, but a very dense book. It kind of outlines a lot of the current state of research and theories and where the gaps in sort of the literature are on astrophysics. I really enjoyed it and I feel like I learned a lot. Because it is so dense, I think it's a nice book to sort of read a little bit at a time, not necessarily in one sitting so that you can really digest it. I have no background in astrophysics at all. So a lot of it was newer information or building on stuff that I learned in high school, like forever ago. But I really do recommend this book if anybody is interested in astrophysics. My only sort of gripe would be that I would personally really like a glossary at the back as somebody who's coming with absolutely zero experience, zero knowledge. I would love a glossary and I would love a little area for continued reading. However, this author uh, and scientist also has a YouTube channel, which is fantastic, so I will forgive him that. Following that, I read A Study in Drowning. I was absolutely thrilled that I managed to get this book a few days early. My bookstore had it out already. I did film a vlog I will link um, with my full thoughts and reading reactions. It is spoiler free. Broadly, I really enjoyed this book. This follows Effie, who is an architecture student. She grows up kind of obsessed with this epic story, this epic novel about the fairy king. And so when she finds out that her favorite author, the author of this story, is opening a competition for people to redesign his house, she excitedly enters and when she goes there, she finds that not everything is as it seems or as it, she expects. Also, there is a sort of an academic rival. I don't know, they're not directly rivals, but there is sort of an academic vibe there. I mean, I think this would appeal to people who are fans of dark academia, but there is a guy named Preston there anyway, who is trying to prove that her favorite author is a fraud. It deals with some darker topics, but they are not on page as some of Ava Reed's other books. The way that she explores things like authorship and trauma are always really interesting and she just does a wonderful job of that. I'll link the reading blog somewhere up above or somewhere down below if you're interested in checking that out. Also on my reading blog, I read Rouge by Mona Awad. This, I think, could be one of my favorite books of the year. And I do not say that lightly. I absolutely loved Bunny and so I was really worried about going into Rouge, how I would feel about it, and it just did not disappoint at all. And as I think about it and process it after the fact, I like it and appreciate it even more. So Rouge follows a woman who is obsessed with skincare videos. She returns back to her sort of hometown or back to where her mother is from in the wake of her mother's death and becomes involved with a sort of beauty cult 
that her mother also had connection to. This has the bizarreness of Bunny and the unreliable sort of narrator that we're familiar with Mona Awad. I really love how she takes inspiration from Snow White in this and, and uses it to comment on the standards of beauty and standards of beauty that are passed down between women. So again, that's in my reading blog. I will link that somewhere around. After that, I read Vampires of El Norte. This was a book that I was really excited about. I absolutely love the Hacienda. So this was something I was really highly anticipating reading. It follows Nestor and Nena, who are childhood friends and they go out one night. Nena is attacked by a vampire. Nestor thinks that she's dead and he flees. Fast forward and then the book begins like 10 years or something later and Nestor returns back and discovers that she is not dead. She has been living this whole time and so she is living with a lot of resentment and, and pain from his abandonment and he is living with a ton of shame for not making sure that she was actually dead. That I would say is the main thrust of the story. There is um, an element of vampires still being around and this backdrop of uh, forces from the U.S. coming and invading. This is set during like the 1840s-ish in Mexico, but I, I really feel like the uh, colonial force from the U.S. and the vampires themselves kind of take a bit of a backseat to the relationship and emotional drama that plays out in the story. Uh, I'm not gonna lie, that was a little bit disappointing with the title Vampires of El Norte. I was really hoping that we would get a bit more vampire lore. And I felt like there wasn't enough tension build up between like vampire attacks and, you know, vampire sightings and things like this. Um, it was kind of like they popped out and went boo. And then, you know, so that is not necessarily a bad thing. That is just uh, that there was a different focus in the book from what I was hoping for. But I think that the character relationships and the dynamics there were done quite well. Uh, I just hoped that there would have been a little bit more of a direct I investigation or uh, playing with the idea of vampirism in the literal or the figurative sense. Following that, I read Sundial. Um, just so everybody's aware, this has animal cruelty in it. I don't usually read trigger warnings. I don't pay attention to them most of the time. I kind of wish that I had for this one. I still read it. It was great, but I was not really prepared for some of the awful things that happened to dogs. I really enjoyed this book. It follows a mother and daughter and they kind of go on this trip to the desert where uh, we're learning a little bit more about the mother's past and there's this dual POV where you're not really sure what the mother's agenda is because the mother is a bit disturbed by some of her daughter's behaviors and that's why they go on this trip and the daughter is kind of afraid that the mother is becoming increasingly unhinged and might kill her. Around halfway through this book we begin bouncing back and forth and getting uh, some insight into what it was like for the mother to grow up in this fairly isolated place in the desert and what her childhood was like. It's kind of trying to explore some of the aspects of nature versus nurture. Now I really enjoyed this book and I'm really excited to read more from Katrian Ward, but I have to say that it wasn't quite a five star for me and some of that, actually most of that, is because of what I do for work. I'm not going to give any spoilers away, but the area that I work in uh, gives me sort of uh, a little bit more knowledge about different equipment and topics and things that are explored in this book that were not always correct. A lot of the book kind of hinged on a little bit and I I can't take that part out of me. It, I mean it's pretty minor, it doesn't really matter that much and it shouldn't be a reason for you not to pick up the book. I actually really would recommend this book if this story sounds intriguing to you um, because it is such a wild ride with so many twists. I just can't take that part of myself that's like out of my reading experience. So that's my personal reading take. I hope that you read it and I hope that you enjoy it because it is uh, really a great book. Following that, I read Such Sharp Teeth. This is another woman turning into a dog story. Uh, apparently that was my thing in September. The best way that I can describe this book is like quirky rom-com girl turns into a werewolf and visits her small town and family sister drama ensues, okay? That is, that is basically the story. The author of this book tends to really excel at sort of a cozy horror vibe. The sun is like getting bright and then it gets dark. It gets bright and then it gets dark. Anyway, quirky rom-com girl gets bitten by a werewolf and she ends up transforming into a werewolf. She's basically trying to juggle that experience and make sense of that experience, all the while navigating some of the complicated family stuff that's going on. So it's, it's just 
a hilarious book. I love how she blends kind of the... I just I had so much fun reading this. It was exactly the kind of spooky fun book that I wanted. So that is such sharp teeth. Following that, I read The Haunting of Hill House. I love Shirley Jackson. It's been years since I've read one of her books, but The Haunting of Hill House is pretty much about this guy, I think he's an anthropologist, and he is interested in studying supernatural phenomena and the people who believe in these kind of things. So he finds a spooky house, Hill House, and recruits three other people to join him in this house and just live there for a while. I feel like this is a great example of how you can write a short book with really well fleshed out characters and really interesting plot, make it scary and uh, complicated. I feel like Shirley Jackson was also just a master of making characters that you kind of root for, but you also don't really like. So I listened to this on audiobook and it was really just the best way to do it. I think that the audio narration was incredible and it was on YouTube for free, so. That's always nice too, but really it was just the best way to spend an evening with a cup of tea and a candle and my cat listening to some modern classic spooky stories. So that is The Haunting of Hill House. Following that, I read Art Matters by Neil Gaiman. I think it is like two-ish speeches or talks that Neil Gaiman has given about art, about reading, about writing. Um, and why it is so important to society. I really loved it. It's wonderful. I always appreciate how there is always something that is really optimistic and really hopeful about the way that he speaks and the way that he writes. <sighs> Three books left. So after that, I read Silver Nitrate. I was very intrigued by the premise of this book. It is set in the 90s, I believe in Mexico. We follow two characters. One is kind of an ex-actor and one is an audio sound production lady named Montserrat. She is kind of like a creepy tomboy girl. She likes horror, she wears a lot of black and is kind of grungy, doesn't mind sleeping rough in audio studio. Okay, they become friends with this other guy who was a director in the 50s of some classic horror books. Through him they hear about this Nazi occultist who imbibed magic into the silver nitrate that was used in the movies. So it's got a really great premise. I loved that aspect. The whole like mix of old classic movies and the Nazis who fled to South America and like occultism. That blend was is magical and I feel like Sylvia Miranda Garcia does such an incredible job with creating these things that maybe you don't think of going together but they go together so well and she just adds such wonderful character to the environments and to the story that she creates. For my taste there might have been a little bit more information that I needed about filmmaking and I felt like sometimes her writing style tells a little bit more than it actually shows. Um, but I, I did have a really good time reading it, I enjoyed it, I thought the romance was weird so I'm kind of in the middle on this one. There are aspects that I am obsessed with, and then there are aspects that I'm like, eh, good read, but I could have done without that part. Yeah, I, I really, I feel like that kind of sums up my thoughts on the book. Then I read The Housemaid's Secret. This book was the sort of second or the sequel to The Housemaid, which blew me out of the water. It had been such a long time since I read a thriller that had such a big twist that I didn't really predict. We meet our main character, she's a housemaid, and she, I think gets triggered very easily by men she thinks are abusive, which is marked by her criminal past, and she is extremely motivated to help women out of bad situations and bad marriages. So she is currently doing her degree now in social work when we meet her in the second book, and I was gripped by this plot. She gets another a cleaning job on the side while she's doing her degree and of course we quickly realize that this marriage between this extremely affluent couple not everything is as it seems. I really enjoyed this book it's there's something about the way that she writes that is very propulsive and very fast to read and very fun. So my, my main challenge with this book is that we hit a halfway point and then there is a twist. All circumstances around the twist are different, but the twist itself, it's pretty similar to the twist in the first book. And I read that first book very recently, and so I did feel like my interest waned 
a little bit around the 60% mark when that happens. But yeah, so that is The Housemaid's Secret, and I definitely had a good time reading it. It did what I think it was trying to do, which is be a fun good time. Um, and I'll probably pick up anything else that Frida McFadden publishes, but I definitely hope very much that it is going to be something a little different. Um, or I had a sense that maybe she's setting up for a third book in this series. If the book series continues, I, I just hope that there's like a different kind of twist. So that's The Housemaid's Secret. Finally, I read The Shadow of the Wind. I have wanted to read this book for years, like 15 years. <laughs> and I finally got to it uh, like two days ago. And this is a very literary leaning mystery set in Barcelona in the wake of World War II and going up until like the 19, late 50s-ish. I would describe the vibe of this book as being like Midnight in Paris meets The Goldfinch by Donna Tartt, like kind of slow and there's a lot of smoking in archways of beautiful old uh, Europe and you are the son of a bookseller talking about you like you're a like it's a RPG or something but it follows Daniel who is the son of a bookseller and when he is a boy he gets to pick out a book from the cemetery of forgotten books which is going to be like his book and he chooses the shadow of the wind he kind of becomes obsessed with this book, this story, and he just has to know more about the author. And as he learns more, he discovers that this is possibly the only book in existence by the author still because, because a lot of people have been trying to track down the author's story and history and the books that he wrote and burning them. We go on this sort of trip through mostly Barcelona to learn more about the author and who these people are and all of the mysteries that are kind of surrounding this book. The prose is extremely romantic. It's really just astounding. It's the kind of book that you feel like you're actually there. Like I was just soaking it up like a sponge. I just loved it so much. I will say there's a ton of characters in this. It is a little bit challenging to follow and I wish that my copy had a glossary, which it doesn't, but I definitely feel like it is very worth the read. My favorite character is Fermin, Fermin, uh, who is basically Daniel's best friend. And he is um, just hysterical. He's a bit of an older guy who's a little bit, like he's sexist, he is sexist, um, but he's also hilarious and really interesting and brings so much of the plot to life. It's a bit of a weird comparison, but there's something about the way that she creates the characters and the way that she creates the environments of her book that reminds me of a similar reading experience that I had when I was a kid reading Cornelia Funke. Funke? Uh, I don't know how to say her name in this book. But like the author of like Inkheart and Dragon Rider and The Thief Lord. There, there's, there's a magical element to the story that I just found super beautiful. Uh, so I think if you liked Cornelia Funke and you wanted something that was more adult and like more mature, um, or if you like The Gollum and the Genie, like Helen Wecker's books, this book would be a really great follow-up to either of those. So those are all of the books that I read in September. As I was saying in my rambly beginning, I probably will not hit very many books in October for various reasons, but mostly because I am so excited to go to Japan. Uh, we booked our tickets last night. While I'm there, uh, I am going to probably be reading The Lonely Castle in the Mirror, but I'm kind of having second thoughts to that plan because it's a bit of an impromptu trip and I was just reading about this book and I think that it is YA and so I'm not sure if that's what I am wanting to read. I don't know if that's what I'm feeling right now. So let me know how young this book feels if you've read it, I guess. Also, we're going to be in the Tokyo area roughly, uh, so do let us know if you have any suggestions because we're there for like eight or nine days and I don't really know how to fill that time. It's our first time in Japan so we're really, I mean I've said it over and over, we're really excited and um, yeah, yeah. Let me know your thoughts on this book, on any of the books that I read in September. Yeah, I'll be back soon with some Tokyo footage.